All right. So I think things are starting to stabilize as far as people entering the meeting room. So maybe um, we can go ahead um, and get started. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to our Federal Highway Office of Safety um, webinar on maintaining pedestrian and bicyclist facilities. Um, again, so this webinar is provided through the Office of Safety um, and not only will provide you with really informative um, uh, practices from agencies um, around the country, but will also help uh, Federal Highway with the kickoff um, of an update to uh, uh, a new guidebook. So um, we're really excited to have, have you all here. All right. My name is Alyssa Goganauer and I'm with VHB. Um, Alan, can we go ahead to the next slide? All right, so just a little bit on webinar logistics um, is that uh, you all will notice if you kind of uh, move your mouse around a little bit that there's a Q&A button at the likely at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can use that to pose questions at any time. So as you're listening to uh, the presentations, if a uh, question pops into your head, please feel free to go ahead and use that. We're gonna be saving time at the end though uh, for discussions um, or for a question and answer session. So um, we're not gonna do that after each presentation, but we'll wait to the end of the webinar. Also certificates of attendance can be requested um, through uh, an emailed questionnaire that all attendees will be receiving um, at the end of the webinar today. All right, go ahead to the next slide. All right, so the agenda today, um, I'm going to let Tamara welcome you all today, um, but we're going to be going over uh, four separate presentations. And I'd like to, um, to uh, introduce each of the speakers today. So first, we'll have Michael Hintz from Tool Design Group. Um, Michael is the Director of Planning and Tool Design Seattle office and has expertise in active transportation, policy and system development land use planning and urban design. And Michael has contributed to a wide variety of transportation projects at the federal, state, regional, and local levels. His focus is on helping communities plan and implement connected and safe active transportation networks that contribute to community resiliency and health. Next, we'll have Trent Rondo from the Houston Parks Board. Uh, for nearly 35 years, Trent has been responsible for planning and development of parks and recreation facilities. This has involved comprehensive park master planning, landscape architecture, environmental design, architectural or architecture, GIS, um, and a wide variety of other roles. In his current role though, um, he is serving as the conservation and maintenance director for the nonprofit Houston Parks Board. He oversees the day-to-day -day and long-term stewardship of the Bayou Greenway system, which includes 100 miles of trails and, and 2,800 acres of green space. Next, we'll have Nicole Loesch from the city of Burlington, Vermont. She's a professional transportation planner with 15 years of experience with the city of Burlington. Her work focuses on new ways to bring transportation improvements to Burlington by engaging the community and peers with municipal pilot projects and quick build construction program. Her projects uh, implement Burlington's vision for safe, sustainable, and enjoyable streets for everyone. And last but not least, we'll have John Leonard from the Virginia Department of Transportation. John is the Urban Program Manager with the Local Assistance Division of VDOT. In his current role, he is responsible for working with VDOT project coordinators and local governments on statewide local maintenance policy and program oversight and the Urban Systems Pavement Funding Programs. Uh, we're excited to have all of these wonderful speakers here with us today, and we hope you appreciate their presentations as much as I do. So. All right, so we can go to the next slide. Um, with that, uh, let's just go over the webinar objectives. Um, so it's to understand future initiatives by Federal Highway to help agencies understand how to maintain pedestrian, bicyclist, and micromobility facilities for enhanced safety. Um, the guide that we're going to talk about today is the original guide, which focused on pedestrians, and the future expansion will include pedestrians and micromobility, or bicyclists and micromobility. Um, we'll also explore how agencies are maintaining their pedestrian and bicyclist facilities, particularly in light of climate change and in the expansion of temporary or quick build facilities. Uh, the webinar will identify strategies for maintaining pedestrian and bicyclist facilities 
And we'll also hope you to learn more about challenging challenges that agencies face and lessons learned regarding pedestrian and bicyclist facility maintenance. Great. Next slide. So before we get into Michael's presentation, Tamara, I wanted to give you a chance to welcome everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. So hello and thanks um, everybody for joining us today for this webinar on maintaining pedestrian and bicyclist facilities. Um, as Alyssa alluded to, um, the webinar is being done as part of a project that the Federal Highway Administration Safety Office has to update a, um, the document, a guide for maintaining pedestrian facilities for enhanced safety. And that document was developed eight years ago um, to address the needs of pedestrian facility maintenance um, also common maintenance issues, funding, and construction techniques to reduce future maintenance. Um, so this obviously new doc document will include um, new information on relevant documents and research and innovations and technology pertaining to that guide and also will be expanded to um, include um, bicyclist facilities as well. So just wanted to thank you all for joining us and taking time um, out of your busy schedules. We appreciate it very much. Great. Thanks. All right, thanks, Tara. Um, and while we start to turn this over to Michael, Alan, how about we go ahead and pull up the first poll question? Um, this isn't a webinar where you all will just be sitting and listening. We also are hoping to gain some information from you all through poll questions that will be, um, uh, we'll have throughout uh, the webinar. So this first question is, does your agency have a system for residents to report maintenance issues? And we'll give you all a minute here to respond. Um, right. So it looks like we've got a really uh, fairly even um, distribution among all of the responses. Give everyone another minute here to respond. So I think we're still um, uh, still waiting for some additional answers. If you haven't, I think we've got most of the folks here. All right, 200 people have responded so far. If you haven't had a chance, please just go ahead and fill in your answer. All right. I think we're good. Michael, do you want to go ahead and start sharing your presentation while we wrap up the polling? Okay. All right. And I think we're good. It looks pretty stable here. Um, so thank you all for taking the time to share that. Great. Well, I'll uh, kick it off then. So I'm going to, um, yeah, provide a, a pretty brief overview of what's in the existing guide for maintaining pedestrian facilities for enhanced safety. I was uh, honored to be a contributor of this original guide eight or nine years ago, and uh, really look forward to kind of presenting what's in it and then hearing from all of you of what you think um, could be improved with the guide to, to make it a useful tool for your practice. Uh, yeah, so while the basic need for, for maintenance of pedestrian facilities hasn't changed um, since this guide was done, there, there are certainly a number of emerging areas that impact maintenance, some of which we'll discuss today. Um, but yeah, the, the original intent of the guide was to really provide guidance for maintaining pedestrian facilities, the primary goal of increasing safety and mobility for, for pedestrians. The guide's audience, um, government bodies at the state, county, local level, homeowners associations, private land management organizations, basically any, any agency or organization that is responsible for the maintenance of, of pedestrian facilities. And by pedestrian facilities, uh, the guide really touches on, on the following, um, sidewalks, walkways, curb ramps, shared use paths, as well as other elements at, at intersections, including crosswalks, signals, and other treatments um, at, at street crossings and signage. So pretty, pretty comprehensive guide in terms of um, the, the treatments and facilities it covers. Uh, the guide presents, uh, spends, spends quite a bit of uh, time 
presenting a case for maintaining pedestrian facilities with a focus on safety, accessibility, mobility, asset management, and liability. So um, in terms of the, the focus, it's really on maintaining an accessible pathway for pedestrians, whether that's between intersections or at the intersections itself and addressing the, the, the things that help pedestrians transition from the sidewalk into the street. And obviously um, there are, there are reducing trips, slips and falls is, a, is an obvious reason for maintaining facilities, but also just re reducing crashes with motorists when there aren't well-maintained pedestrian facilities, pedestrians are often forced into the street and in uh, conflict with, with passing motorists. At its core, uh, accessible designs are significantly undermined if maintenance is neglected and pedestrian facilities are allowed to degrade to a state where they cannot be used or avoided. So um, really focused on, on that, maintaining the accessible pathway. Most obvious examples of compromised pedestrian facilities are of sidewalks and curb ramps where snow and ice are blocking facilities for days or even weeks at a time. However, sidewalk facility defects or malfunctioning pedestrian signals can also have a more subtle uh, but just as negative year-round impact on pedestrian travel and really, really uh, interfere with a person's ability to, to make a, a walking trip or a transit trip that, that requires walking to access transit. The guide uh, talks a lot about asset management. Um, Ashto defines asset management as a strategic and systematic process of operating, maintaining, upgrading, and expanding physical assets effectively throughout their life cycle. So, um, the guide discusses just how how good good data, good inventory leads to better decision making, and provides some some information and case studies on on that topic. The guide de dedicates a significant amount of attention to liability. Uh, liability varies from state to state and community to community, uh, but when there's a breakdown in maintenance of pedestrian facilities, the outcome can result. Uh, in, a, in an injury and related objective of the, the guide is, is really to manage liability. Um, having a sound maintenance program can significantly reduce an agency's exposure to liability. And a written policy is certainly better than having uh, informal or unwritten policy. The guide talks about um, different surface materials that um, pedestrian facilities consist of, primarily concrete and asphalt, and kind of the pros and cons of each of those materials, and uh, later gets into kind of the, the common uh, maintenance issues that, that result from the use of those, each of those materials. Uh, seasonal maintenance concerns is a, is a big focus of the guide, um, particularly winter maintenance, but also there's discussion and, and examples of um, maintaining other seasonal concerns uh, like leaf debris and overgrowth of vegetation. Uh, so there's quite a bit of information on just these, these seasonal concerns. And then um, inspection and accessibility uh, is a big part of, of maintaining a pedestrian system and it outlines steps in an inspection program and provides examples of, of best practices. So really setting thresholds for when facilities need to be uh, maintained or when they, when they uh, present as a hazard. And then uh, finally, the, the guide talks about um, compliance and discusses the components of an effective compliance program with a focus on um, laws and ordinances that establish such a, such a program and um, best practices for making sure that, that these laws and ordinances are clearly communicated, they're fair, they're prompt, consistent, and predictable. A really important um, part of that is just ensuring that 
the responsibilities between the, the city or whatever agency uh, that, that owns a roadway and, and adjacent property owners, for example, is clearly defined uh, for all parties. And then, um, yeah, just the guy provides some, some tips and, and examples of uh, what makes a, a strong policy or ordinance. Um, one that really outlines the inspection procedures and criteria, and again, the responsibilities of, of property owners and the, the community at large. Having uh, a, a plan in place, a, a maintenance plan in place is really uh, a great way to cover all facets of pedestrian maintenance. And the guide talks about uh, the various components of what might be in a maintenance plan, including uh, prioritization and funding. Obviously, uh, in many communities, maintenance needs far outstrip the, the resources that are available to address them. So prioritizing is a really important part of that. Um, again, communicate, communication um, and you know who's responsible for what documentation, uh, including documenting reasonable procedures for, for addressing maintenance needs. And then finally, equipment and um, equipment that's needed and its life expectancy and uh, plan for, for replacing that, that um, equipment over time. Um, the, the guide gets into different methods for, for repairing production facilities, um, including temporary short-term measures like like sidewalk wedging uh, that are intended to, to last, you know, five years or less, and then longer term measures as well. And then talks about the different measures um, for maintaining seasonal, seasonal maintenance, uh, including vegetation and kind of, again, outlining responsibilities of, of property owners um, and extensive discussion around snow and ice uh, maintenance measures and different different techniques and, and methods for doing that. Uh, the guide goes into some depth on construction techniques and considerations that prolong the life of, of sidewalks and pathways, starting with the subgrade um, and moving into pavement design and drainage, uh, which I know is something that um, Trent is gonna touch on. And, and control joints and, and how to properly construct a facility for, for long-term um, life. Also talks about construction techniques and, and issues that arise with curb ramps, detectable warning fields, and street trees uh, is a big topic in the guide. Um, discusses proper site conditions that are essential for, for trees to thrive as well as to maintain sidewalks. And then um, it does get into discussion around funding and different methods for funding, um, including programs that are funded by uh, budding property owners and programs funded by community taxes, funds, and fees. Uh, so discussion at the kind of local government uh, level, state aid funds that, that may be available um, and other methods for, for funding maintenance. The guide also has a, a number of appendices, um, including model sidewalk inspection policy, uh, worksheets on, on kind of what, how to determine um, things like protruding objects and other, other elements that uh, may meet thresholds for maintenance, uh, risk management information, and then example policies and programs from a number of, of communities. So we've, um, as, as Tamara and Alyssa mentioned earlier, uh, we are focused on updating this, the content of this uh, pedestrian maintenance guide, as well as expanding it uh, to include bicycle facility maintenance. And, you know, some of the known updates, uh, we know that it could, there's some, some improvements that could be made to the readability of the document, less wordy, more diagrams and pictures. Um, Updating some of the case study examples is to make sure they're still relevant and accurate. 
and then um, some new topics that that have have been identified. And um, this is definitely not a comprehensive list, but you know, with climate change and frequent flooding and and other issues resulting from climate change, there are maintenance issues that that uh, occur. Um, also, just more information about new funding sources and funding processes and um, quick build, which um, Nicole is going to get into and, and, you know, those types of projects, how they're maintained over time so that they're, um, they're safe and accessible. And then finally, um, we won't get into it now, but during the Q&A, we'd love to hear some thoughts uh, that you may have on what would be most valuable as a as a practitioner to have um, regarding bicycle facility maintenance. You know, some ideas, obviously seasonal maintenance, pavement markings and vertical elements, different techniques and equipment, and then funding and programming. So definitely look forward to um, your questions and ideas around uh, that topic. So that is all I have, Alyssa. Great. All right. Thank you, Michael. So hopefully that gives you all a sense of, you know, what is in that current guide and some of the opportunities that we're thinking of for um, the future uh, version of the guide. Um, and of uh, note as well is that that future guide will likely include bicyclists and micromobility considerations as well. Um, we're focused, you know, primarily these presentations on the pedestrian and bicyclist side, um, but that will be something that will be uh, likely considered for the update. Um, with that, I'd like to maybe turn it over and we can um, uh, get to uh, the poll questions. We have three more for you. Um, so let's go ahead and pull up the second poll question, Alan. Um, and this is that, what are the top pedestrian and bicyclist facility maintenance issues or concerns um, that you face in your job? So is it things like lack of staffing or funding resources, lack of appropriate equipment, um, lack of a plan or priorities? You can choose um, more than one option for this. Uh, so let's go ahead and see what challenges you all are facing. All right. Okay. Um, and I know for some of you that, you know, um, maybe aren't with a, a public agency that you might feel like this isn't as um, pertinent. So I, I do apologize. A lot of these are focused more on um, uh, agencies that own or maintain uh, their roadway facilities. Um, okay, so definitely it looks like lack of st staffing and funding resources is a big one that so far is kind of coming out on top uh, by far followed by a lack of plan or priorities and unclear maintenance policies. Um, so I think we can go ahead and end this poll question. And then we'll go to um, poll question number three. So thank you all. And um, this one here is, have you consulted with the Federal Highway Pedestrian uh, Facilities Maintenance Guide? Um, and so, uh, you know, that's the guide that um, Michael just presented on. Um, you're not going to hurt any of our feelings if uh, with no answers. So please just, uh, you know, we're hoping to understand maybe some of the reach of it. Um, so, all right, it looks like we've got uh, still have a decent amount of responses coming in. So we'll give you all another minute for this one. Okay. All right like couple couple last responses. I think we, we're good to probably go ahead and close this one then. Thank you all. We've got one last question before um, our next presentation. So let's go ahead and pull up four. There we go. So it's, does your jurisdiction have an asset management system that includes any of the following? Um, so sidewalks, crosswalks, you can have, you can select multiple choice. Um, we also have a response at the end for none of the above. Okay. Um, you know, these are the types of things that really help to understand, you know, where you have facilities that you under, you know, can use that to then create the um, maintenance plans for those. It looks like we've got a lot of agencies, maybe with sidewalk and crosswalk data as part of an asset management plan so far. 
Um, a little less on the on the bicyclist side. Thankfully, it seems like you know much fewer that say uh, none of the above. So, I'll give you all just another minute here. I'll have a couple answers. Okay, all right. Well, um, I think that we're pretty stable here in our responses. So maybe we'll go ahead and close this poll. And then we're gonna switch over to Trent, who's going to talk um, about, you know, some of the shared use paths in Houston and maintenance of those within the parks and also how climate change has impacted um, the way that they do business. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Trent. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. So uh, I do work for the Houston Parks Board, which we are, um, a little different than a lot of other park foundations or conservancies in that we are not geographically tied to a single park. Uh, over our 45 years of existence, we have done projects in more than 250 parks around the city of Houston. We've added more than 14,000 acres to the park system here, and we've leveraged more than $300 million in making improvements and developing new parks within Houston. Our biggest project to date is what we call by Greenways, and it is a vision to complete what was originally designed and laid out in 1912, and that would be a system of linear parks along our major bayous here in Houston. When it's completely built out, it will uh, add 3,000 acres of green space to the park system and include 150 miles of trails uh, along nine major bayous rivers for everyone else bayous here in Houston. Uh, the Buy Greenways campaign is a $220 million campaign. 100 million of that was approved in November of 2012 as public bonds. And then the Houston Parks Board committed to raise $120 million to match that. And we've actually exceeded that amount. And over the last five or six years, as part of this gets developed out, it's adding bike facilities along uh, the bayous that uh, allow people to use the trails for commuting to work, commuting to school, for recreation. We also are able to uh, get trails uh, out into parts of the city that people normally would not have had access to or would never have thought to go to, uh, particularly the more natural areas where you don't have a lot of public access or visibility. The important part for us was always trying to get people out along the bayous. For decades, the bayous were really just seen as drainage ditches and people wouldn't necessarily pay a lot of attention to them until they started flooding. Uh, with the Bay Greenways development, what we've done is we've created a lot of spaces that not only serve the wildlife, but they're also very important for the people that live along the, the bayous. Along with that comes an important commitment to maintenance. Uh, with every facility that gets developed, it falls within our, our Buy Greenways maintenance program that we have. It's an 80-year agreement that uh, is between the City of Houston and the Houston Parks Board for us to do the maintenance. It has committed funding that's in place, can't be tapped into or stolen for other uses. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of coordination that goes on between us and the city, but also the Flood Control District uh, and other uh, public agencies as well. And most importantly is an assurance to our donors that uh, helped us raise the $120 million that the work that gets done with their funds would be maintained at a very high level for a very long period of time. So when we started the, the maintenance program in 2014, uh, at the time we were maintaining about 50 miles. We took over from the city and county uh, and the, over the next seven years that, that system would get built out and along with that, the budget requirements would go up as well. Um, and one of the important parts is that uh, in addition to the operating budget, the green bars in here, we set aside an additional 20% in a maintenance reserve that can be tapped into for all of those unexpected, unanticipated uh, issues that come up, whether it's related to flooding or uh, something else. And this is one of the things that was very important for our program in that uh, when you have a catastrophic flood event, you don't want to be tapping into your, your operating funds as your only source to recover from that. You want to be able uh, to have some additional funds set aside as a rainy day fund uh, for you to be able to, to recover from those events. So our funding structure basically is we have the operating account that recover, that 
that covers all of our routine maintenance. It covers our staffing, at our conservation program, uh, the maintenance reserve I just talked about. So that's set aside for us to do major flood cleanup and unexpected uh, issues that come up with the capital assets. And then we also have a capital replacement reserve, which is set aside for the long-term re replacement of those built facilities when they are beyond their useful life. So the operating account, this covers, uh, again, all of our routine maintenance. So mowing the grass, picking up trash, graffiti abatement, dealing with homeless encampments. We have forestry issues. Uh, our crews de-litter along every bayou that we maintain every week. So this is all the way down to the water's edge. Prior to our maintenance program, most of that litter just laid there until the next flood came along and carried it farther downstream. With, with our operating account, we also do our conservation work. We're focused on three major habitats uh, that end up creating areas for wildlife, but also importantly, it allows us to educate the general public about the importance of these spaces. When you live in a very large urban area, many people never have an opportunity to really encounter nature uh, in, in their neighborhoods. We also are, are working with various groups uh, for our stewardship program. So we contract with groups like Student Conservation Association, the Conservation Corps. Uh, we partner with the Parks Department, the Audubon Society, many other groups. Uh, we've even got a program uh, we had a program for a while where we were uh, taking some of our invasive vegetation to the zoo and they were using the, that to feed to the animals. Uh, our, our program also includes a, a, a pretty good volunteer program where we're using volunteers to uh, plant wildflower seeds, develop prairies and wetlands. Uh, we have a, a group of dedicated, educated uh, conservationists that volunteer as part of our green team and they'll actually go out and do plant rescues uh, prior to us coming in and doing some of our larger projects. And then of course we have our cor corporate partnerships as well, which uh, are very important for us because it allows us to engage communities in large numbers uh, in specific areas of the city that may otherwise not have a lot of population uh, that would come out to volunteer. And then our capital replacement program, this is uh, taking facilities that had lived, outlived their useful life and, and replacing those. Um, we've, re we've done bridges, we've done trash cans, drinking fountains, everything you can imagine across the system over the last seven years. But one of the things that I was specifically asked to talk about is the impact of uh, rainfall and flooding. So here's some examples. So Harris County is right here by the Gulf of Mexico uh, in some extreme. So 2011, we had the worst single year drought in our history. Uh, we average about 50 inches of rainfall a year. And then you fast forward just six years and Harris County received an average of 75 inches. One spot near Clear Creek, you can see the vast difference there. You can imagine the impact of 105 inches of rain in, a, in an area. The drought killed 5 million trees, which ultimately then we launched into a program with many other green groups in Houston to uh, replant those trees over a 10 year period, uh, starting with uh, 2020. So by 2030, we, we, our goal would be to plant nearly 5 million trees to replace those. And then you can see the impact of flooding, 100,000 homes flooded in just one flood event in 2017. In fact, four of the top 10 flood events over the last 40 years occurred over a three year period. Sometimes the flooding is relatively minor. So here's a trail that runs along the bayou that's impacted by flooding. Uh, but all of this is what we would consider minor flooding. This is fairly routine. It happens to us six to eight times a year. Sometimes the flooding can be quite severe. So here's an example over a three day period. Uh, during Hurricane Harvey, you can see the trail is down here on the lower shelf. Street is up here above. This is about 20 feet above this, the trail level, and you can see that same shot three days later. And this is another location along a different bayou, and again, the trail's on the lower shelf. Bayou normally is down here, so the street right here is about 20 feet up, and again, the water level is all the way up to the bottom of that bridge. And you can imagine with this, you get a lot of a, a lot of damage. So. Uh, this is a, a, a chart that shows for Hurricane Harvey, you know, people talk about 100-year floods and 500-year floods. 
for part of Harris County, Hurricane Harvey was a 20,000 year flood, something that we hope to never see again. And the flooding impacts uh, along the trail system. So we see a lot of washouts, uh, particularly where, uh, where the, the bayou is not fortified in any way. Uh, debris caught up in the railings left on the trails in all the landscape areas, down trees throughout the system. Uh, this section of, of White Oak Bayou, the trees are bent over this way because the water level was about 25 feet high here and, and it just pushed the trees over. And then the mountains of silt that get left behind. So this is what washes downstream through the storm sewers and, and gets pulled from those eroded areas. And it just leaves uh, just inches or feet of silt left behind and the process to, to clean that up is really the, the important part that, that we, we get out there and do as quick as possible. So sometimes it's, it's fairly simple when you're dealing with uh, smaller amounts. Other times you're, you're having to, to uh, get out there with small equipment. Other times you're using larger earth moving equipment. And all of this silt, because it's basically muddy clay, uh, we end up loading up and hauling up to the top shelf where it can dry out and then can be uh, placed elsewhere or taken to landfills as cap material. Uh, when it gets really bad, then again, we're bringing in large pieces of equipment to collect the silt. We haul it up to the top shelf, pile it up and let it dry up. And then you can see the, the line of trucks here lined up to uh, haul that, that material off. Once you've got the trails cleaned up enough that people can start reutil reutilizing those to get back to work and school, uh, and for recreation, then we come back in and we start tackling the other areas. Uh, we'll get debris out of the railings. We'll get debris out of the landscaped areas. We'll collect all the heavy debris and get the areas restored. Uh, in some cases, we'll, we'll have to come back in and either hydro seed to reestablish vegetation or we'll, we'll come in and sod those areas as well. And here's an example. This is a relatively minor flood, but uh, we had a flood six days before the grand opening for this section of the trail. We were able to come in and get it cleaned up in time for grand opening event. So this is a little dashboard we use that talks about the number of flood events. So since 2014, we've had 60 flood events. Six of those are considered major. We've hauled off over 3,000 dump truck loads of silt and debris. And you can see the costs involved in those cleanups over $3 million since 2014. And this is a, a dashboard similar to this for our overall conservation and maintenance program that includes the flooding numbers, but, but shows uh, all the work that we do to clean up the debris that's not flood related, the conservation work we do, uh, all of the facilities we're responsible for maintaining. We've spent about eight, $8.8 million doing capital replacement projects. Our annual budget is about 11.2 million. And with that, I am done. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think it was really interesting kind of seeing that the history of those weather patterns in recent years and the challenges that that has um, caused uh, for your department. So um, we're going to save the questions for the end. So maybe with that, um, we can go ahead and go to our next poll question. All right. So how does your agency know when maintenance is needed? Um, is it regularly scheduled? Do you rely on complaints to help address things? Uh, do you have a set of criteria and thresholds and when it meets those, um, that's when you know or other. And I should note that if you want to select other, um, that uh, you can go ahead and use the Q&A tab or uh, button to answer uh, to put in your response. Um, it doesn't look like anyone has responded yet. Hopefully you all are seeing the um, poll question. Are folks seeing it? This is weird. I'm not seeing any responses come in yet either. Let me, um, let me toggle yeah. it off and try to reshare it and see what happens. Okay. Let's do that again. Relaunch. Okay, there, there we, we go. go. Now I see it. That's weird. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm not muted, am I? <laughs> so, 
Great. Oh, look like a ton of responses coming in quickly here. Um, again, please feel free to go ahead and use that Q&A to answer in your response if you put in other. So, great. So it looks like we're stay getting a little more stable here and the response is coming in. We'll give folks just another minute here and then we'll move on to the next poll question. All right, I think we've got it. So let's go ahead to the next poll question now. And this is, does your organization have a written, in, a written maintenance policy or plan for pedestrian, bicyclists, or micromobility facilities? Uh, so this is just, you can select one for this. So we've got um, no, we have yes, but only those within the right of way, yes, within certain departments, um, such as the parks department or others, um, and yes, for all facilities. And again, we have other as an option. So if you wanna select other, Feel free to answer your uh, put your answer in the Q and A, um, so we can record it. Okay, looks like we've got a good amount of responses. We'll just give you just another minute here. Okay, I think we're uh, stabilizing there. Um, okay, get your last answers in, anyone. And, okay, I think we could probably um, go ahead and close this poll. And then what we're gonna do is we'll turn it over to Nicole. She's going to talk about um, the city of Burlington and especially dealing with the maintenance of quick build projects. So with that, Nicole, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. This has been a fascinating webinar already. So happy to contribute and talk a little bit about our quick build program. Um, so why do we do quick builds? First of all, um, we really developed this program so that we could quickly invest in our public safety projects. This really allows us to build a lot of projects at once. With that, we can build momentum both for the infrastructure changes themselves, but also kind of the momentum throughout the community to see the value of this kind of work and the, again, the public safety improvements that we're trying to make. One other benefit is that we often use these kind of as a public engagement tool in themselves. And so it gives us a chance to get something on the ground, get feedback and make any changes or adapt before we come in and spend the money on final construction. Our quick builds kind of fit into two different areas of our project delivery. Um, one are our pilot projects, and these are typically in place for 30 days to a year, and then our interim program, which is really what we call our quick builds, um, which could be in place for many years. And the two areas that we don't typically use these kind of materials or this program are for demonstration projects, which are very short-lived, or for our final construction. So I'm going to talk mostly about our pilots and our, our interim projects. Um, just quickly, you know, distinguishing between the two, our pilots are really data driven. And so these are projects that have a clear set of metrics and a process for how we're going to evaluate the project or the materials even. Um, it allows us to test the impacts of the project itself or the impacts of the materials um, and really gauge community support. Usually our pilots are both measuring quantitative and qualitative metrics. This photo series is just a quick example of a protected bike lane installation and the pilot that we tried two different types of materials and just the protected bike lane in itself. We were piloting that, but we tried tall flex, flex posts and we tried low, what we called armadillos. Um, it was a great learning process. You know, we tried two different materials for several reasons. One was that it's a more residential area and fairly high traffic volume. So we wanted to see either the benefit or the challenge of using something like the armadillos where trash and recycling service, as an example, could still get curbside without having to drive over the flex posts all the time. We still found them to be a little bit challenging. You know, the picture up in the top corner, it just shows that the top is shaved off of one. Um, what we found actually is this material itself is really quite durable. Um, the bigger maintenance challenge was actually picking up things like hubcaps and filing insurance claims because drivers just consistently ran into these things for whatever reason. So again, good um, process to learn about the material itself. 
our other program that we often, sorry, I'm not advancing here, there we go. Um, the other program that we've developed really for our quick builds is the interim design program. And this is, again, what's helped us to rapidly implement a lot of projects. So we developed a whole design guide that has both design selection. So like what type of projects might we use a quick build for, give us some general dimensions or uh, just types of facilities that we're trying to install. And then there's a whole section on material standards. Um, this isn't set in stone, but it's just really a guide for us to be able to look back and see for a type of project that we're working on, what is a good starting place to think about materials, the height, all of those um, considerations. And again, for the rapid implementation, this has really helped us to make some progress. So we adopted our first uh, walk bike plan in 2017. And every year since then, we've been trying to do a quick snapshot of, you know, how are we doing? And so this is just to highlight our intersection projects in particular is where we're making a lot of progress with the quick build approach. We had a goal in there to make improvements at 20 of our high crash locations. And they were generally intersections that um, have a lot of pedestrian crashes. And so just in the, the few years since we adopted the plan, we've been able to make improvements at 11 of those 20 intersections. And that's even considering the last couple of years where I think we maybe did one because of the pandemic. Um, we, we did very few projects. So again, a really useful tool in order to quickly get some improvements on the ground. It's also been really helpful from a community building perspective. So demonstration projects, we actually have a program that allows anybody in the community to do a demonstration. So this one intersection is an example of one that started as a demonstration project. It was a partnership with AARP and our Chamber of Commerce worked with local makers to create some, basically an outdoor living room at an intersection, uh, worked with our local advocates to make it a whole intersection project. But this is just a good example where it started out as community demonstration. Um, it went really well. There were definitely changes that needed to be made to make it uh, really functional. Um, but we came back the next year, taking those lessons learned, installed the quick build, it was in place for a year. Um, this was one of our first installations. And so it was a good maintenance opportunity to figure out you know, what was working material wise. And the following year we were repaving. And so we removed it and were able to take the materials and put them in another location. Um, so it was a kind of good test run from demonstration all the way to construction in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, but it doesn't always have to be pretty or follow that process. Um, the photo on the left was our kind of vision for one quick build that we were doing. We closed a right turn lane um, so that we could shorten a pedestrian crossing and just do some intersection improvements. We were going to install these artist enhanced Jersey barriers. Um, we ended up having to start with just basically construction barrels. Uh, we did replace those with Jersey barriers not long after but we never managed to coordinate it with the local artists because of insurance requirements and other challenges. So it ended up just as a Jersey, bar Jersey barriers, but um, again, still a useful project in the end. So don't let the aesthetics always deter you. Um, maintenance though is often, yeah, not, not pretty. So this is just an example of some of the other challenges that we often face. Um, our quick build curb extensions in particular, um, we use these kind of low bollards at our curb extensions. Uh, we think they're a little bit more out of a pedestrian scale. Um, they're pretty durable too, even in our winter environments, but they do get beat up. You know, the reflective strips peel off, they get pretty dingy. Um, we did choose the white color. The planters themselves, we opted for a self-watering planter, which they've been great, but um, they are graffiti magnets and so we have to factor in regular maintenance for graffiti removal. Um, we've also switched to making sure that we have some kind of landscaping in there in the winter time, because otherwise they tend to just fill up as you can kind of see here, either with trash or just um, water and other debris. Uh, sweeping and other maintenance is another constant challenge for us. Um, spring through fall, it collects everything from leaves and just roadside debris that we have to go in and clean up and then in the winter time, we have to make sure that any nearby catch basins or um, just water in general that we're able to keep those clear. We've only had a couple of locations where we have ponding kind of like you can see here, but 
again, just another maintenance piece that we have to be mindful of. Um, this isn't the type of infrastructure that we can just drop on the ground and walk away. For bike lanes themselves, um, again, an example of a project that started as a demonstration, progressed into a quick build. And our first material choice is what you can see um, in this second photo in, we opted to try something that we thought was like a low curb basically, and then had some bollards on top placed pretty sporadically. And within a month, we lost a third of the posts themselves. And then winter time, the plows started picking up the bases or the little plastic curb until there was very, very little left. So the next year we removed all of that material and opted for just a regular tall flex post, but um, winter maintenance is still a big challenge for us. We have a fleet of sidewalk plows that we've used for decades to clear our sidewalks. And that's what we've tried to use for our bike, bike lanes. But um, yeah, it's becoming quite apparent that we need some additional equipment to really do this well. There is a bike lane hidden under all of that snow. So this is an example of how we're currently taking an approach to developing a better maintenance plan. Um, we've listed out our type of quick build infrastructure, what type of maintenance tasks we think we need to do, who should be responsible. Um, and then we're trying to really factor in how many hours and how often do we think we should do these things. And so we're using this as a tool to hopefully request some additional staff and equipment to do this well. A um, couple of last points, um, material selection can often be a factor in how much maintenance you're going to have to do for your quick builds. Everything from, you know, are you anchoring it with epoxy or an actual anchor in the ground? Is it a recessed anchor? Is it on the surface? Um, winter dur durability is a factor. Um, again, we chose self-watering planters, but sometimes there are benefits to choosing a regular planter. Uh, graffiti removal in terms of like, you know, what kind of surface is it? How easy is it to use graffiti wipes? Or do you have a paint that's going to match it? Um, we tried to partner with outside agencies for some of this. We've talked with a lot of artists and other volunteers who've been interested and none of those have been sustainable options. So we've really had to figure out another way for the installation and repair of all of these. And so just a quick summary of our lessons learned. Um, you know, even though there are some maintenance challenges with these, these still allow us to build on average four times more than we could if we were going straight for construction. So again, if we're thinking about how to prioritize public safety, it's still worth it for us to use this kind of approach. Um, but we have found that like we need a really clear maintenance plan. We've considered external contracts and maybe that would work for other agencies. Um, material selection is something to think about. Um, because we're a winter community, spring cleaning is a, a, one of our first maintenance tasks every year. And then our goal is to get at least monthly sweeping and monthly graffiti removal. Um, year round plant maintenance instead of just the spring through fall and then winter cleanup of the snow and ice. And then um, year round, we really do have to look at bollard replacement or just material replacement in general. Um, and then, you know, phasing out of quick builds, um, we do have to be kind of flexible in the interim, whether it's changing materials or changing approaches, but we found that it's still helpful to have a plan to phase out of it, both for our own internal planning for our capital program, but it can also be really helpful for that external communication so that people know um, how long these might be on the ground, what our process is for selecting what's going to be maintained, or they might expect to be on the ground for quite a while. So that is a pretty quick and fast overview of our quick build program. I'm happy to talk more about this at the end. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. I know that you know with the expansion of these quick build projects across the country, it's, the maintenance side has been um, a concern and a question for a lot of agencies. Um, so with that, Alan, can we go ahead and pull up the next poll? All right. So along those lines, this question is, have maintenance challenges inhibited your agency's installation of temporary slash quick build facilities? I almost hesitate to use the term temporary because I do think that's the way that they're described oftentimes, but they may also be in place for quite a while um, and not be so temporary in nature. So I think we kind of focus on the quick build side of things. All right, so it looks like for many agencies that has the, the maintenance challenges have inhibited um, the agency's installation of those, those types of facilities. So 
um, right now about 65% of the respondents are saying yes. Um, if you select other, please feel free to put your response in the Q&A. Okay. All right, still getting a handful of responses in. Leave it open for a minute longer. All right, I think we're probably pretty good and can go ahead and close the poll. So yes, seems to be, uh, it seems like it's a challenge for many agencies. Um, the next poll question is, um, uh, is your agency consider considering leaving temporary or quick build facilities as is? rather than replacing them with more permanent types of installation. So if we think about curb extensions being a good example of that, you know, rather than using um, paints or pavement markings and you know, maybe delineators instead using curb and gutter and concrete types of installations. So as of right now, most of the re respondents are saying no that their agencies aren't considering leaving those quick build facilities um, in place. We'll give everyone just another minute here to respond. If you've got other, again, please use the Q&A to go ahead and enter your response into it. Okay. All right. I think we've kind of stabilized here in the responses. We could uh, probably go ahead and close this poll as well. Um, and next we'll move on. So we've got John Leonard here from VDOT to talk about some maintenance policies and how that um, influences um, improving pedestrian and bicyclist facilities. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna talk about bicycle and transit only lane conversions. Um, and as Alyssa said, I'm John Leonard. I'm the urban program manager with uh, the local assistance division of VDOT. So my job is kind of to like help um, our urban localities with the maintenance of their streets and their roadways. I'm going to start out by giving a brief overview of the urban maintenance program. So in Virginia, we have 85 localities who receive payments from VDOT for maintenance of their roads. Um, these payments are going to be based on moving lane miles. Um, and then each functional class receives a different rate per lane mile. Uh, and to kind of give you an idea of how that works, I have the figure here on the right. Um, you can see the left side, we have four moving lanes. And then on the right side, we have two moving lanes, but both of these have the same amount of pavement. Um, so in the past, uh, it, say we have the before and we want to do a road diet, add in some bicycle lane facilities, that conversion would happen and then the locality would then lose two moving lane miles and would lose that money from their maintenance funding. We actually had a locality who wanted to do a major um, bicycle and transit project throughout their city. and. Um, they realized that if they moved forward with it, they would lose somewhere between 500,000 and a million dollars from their maintenance budget. So what they did is they went to their um, delegate and then uh, during the General Assembly, uh, there was an amendment to the Code of Virginia. And in this, um, what happened is a locality who is converting an existing facility um, to, with, uh, to bicycle lanes or transit lanes, does not lose uh, payments for that conversion. So if we go back and look at this figure, um, the after image would still receive four moving lanes worth of payments, even though they added the center turn lane and the bicycle facilities, which in the past would not have received payments. Um, and all of these conversions are only eligible after July 1, 2014, which is when uh, the revision was passed. Uh, and then there's also a, pro a provision that the number of moving lane miles converted is not more than 50 moving lane miles or 3% of the city or town's total number of moving lane miles. And it's basically whichever one comes first, that's gonna be the limit at which you can make these conversions. All right, and then the way that they do that is they essentially make a request to the Department of Transportation 
to accept the conversion and then update the urban maintenance inventory system so that they can continue to receive payments for that facility. I'm gonna go through just kind of like the process of how that request works. Um, we have three things that we ask them to just provide to us in order to make that conversion happen so they can continue to receive their payments. Um, the first one is the U1 form. Uh, the U1 form, essentially what it does is it, it outlines all the attributes of a roadway and then says what action that the city or town wishes to take. Um, so for, for example, if they want to do a bicycle lane conversion, they would simply select bicycle lane conversion, and then they would put the attributes of the street, um, which, which was having the bicycle lane, bicycle lane conversion. They would say it's going to be from here to here, this many lanes, et cetera. So in addition to the U1 form, um, we also asked that they um, adopt a resolution. And in this resolution, we want language that the design has been assessed by a professional engineer. And we're really looking for two things. Um, the first is that the level of service of the street will not be impacted. Um, and, and if it is, uh, that the associated roadway network will retain the adequate capacity uh, to meet future mobility needs. The second thing is that the conversion has been uh, designed in accordance with the National Association of City Transportation Officials Urban Bikeway Design Guide. That is a mouthful. All right, so next we have the sketch. So we asked them to just provide us with a sketch, map, roadway plans, a diagram, kind of outlining where the design will be from and to. And then all of these documents will be provided to the VDOT district office um, at the beginning of each year. Um, it'll also contain any additions they have to the system, any deletions they have to the system, um, and any information like that. So the district will go out, review, um, look at the licensed engineer's design, and say, yes, we believe this is acceptable. Um, they'll send it to me. I'll also review the documents and take a look. Um, and that's basically how, how the process works. Um, and finally, uh, I just wanted to, to kind of show you one of the transit projects. Um, you can see here the city converted several lanes to bus lanes and that they still retain the original um, number of moving lane payments. Um, we're, we're super excited about this. It was definitely a part of our urban program that we had overlooked. Um, and I think it's a great thing that cities and towns can now be encouraged and not discouraged in converting their moving lanes to bicycle, pedestrian, and transit facilities. So I'm super excited about this part of the program and um, excited to share it with you all too. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, John. Um, I know that there have been a handful of questions uh, tied to funding, um, and I think that looking at the policies to help make sure that there's funding available um, is really important and also that those policies don't discourage um, the improvement of pedestrian and bicyclist facilities. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, so we have three final poll questions that we're going to pull up and then we're going to start to get into the questions that you all have posed to the Q&A. Um, so, all right. Uh, so the cool question that we have now is, does your agency have maintenance policies that support the enhancement of pedestrian and bicyclist facilities? So we've got a lot of responses coming in. That's great to see. Okay. So it looks like we've got a fairly even disbursement of responses. Although yes and no are both um, taking the lead. Um, it looks like quite a few agencies have policies that are in development um, and a handful of folks that are unsure. Okay, we'll leave this open for just another moment. Okay, 
All right, looks like the answers have stabilized quite a bit. So I think we could probably move on to the next question. All right, so uh, this is question 10. Does your agency have maintenance policies that inhibit the enhancement or installation of pedestrian and bicyclist facilities? So as John had mentioned, the original policy that Virginia had uh, meant that installing road diets um, uh, that included especially things like bike lanes, um, the original policy uh, did inhibit that, but the modification um, uh, really helped. So, okay. So it looks like we still have uh, some answers coming in here, but it looks like most of you are saying no. So that's that's really good um, to, to hear. Give you just another moment to finish up. All right, so I think we're pretty stable here on the responses. So maybe we can close this and go to the last poll question. Okay, and this is, you know, thinking about that future guidance um, and the update to it is what topics around, um, and sorry, we did put bicycle facility maintenance. This should be pedestrians, bicyclists, um, and I could include micromobility in there as well. So um, uh, what topics do you think that you could benefit from with some additional information? Looks like funding and programming is quite popular among the responses. This is multiple choice. If you do select other, um, you can enter your response in the Q&A um, section there. All right, funding and programming is still at the top. So really good to hear. Okay. Great. Okay, well, I think we could probably go ahead and close this one. Funding and programming was definitely the top response. So, all right. So we can take that back and we'll go ahead and get into the questions that you all have posed. Lots of good questions in here. So, um, you know, I think I would like to open this up more broadly among the group as a whole. So maybe um, you all can take some turns answering this. And this is around the responsibility. So, um, you know, any thoughts that you all have with, um, you know, working with partner agencies to really define the appropriate responsibilities, like where does the city's responsibility end versus the transit agency versus the parks department and whatnot. So are any of you able to speak about how you really get in there and define those boundaries or how you also maybe come to a resolution if there are unknowns, um, bridges were brought up as, you know, kind of some, some gray areas sometimes. So uh, would any of you like to go ahead and take a stab at answering that? I'll offer some, some comments. So for us as a nonprofit, we work with multiple public agencies and we have agreements in place with all of those that outline generally their responsibilities versus our responsibilities. Uh, there are some things that are very specific in there about you know how often we're supposed to do our maintenance. Um, we are responsible for maintaining pedestrian bridges, right? So that was part of the agreement when we started our program that we would take on that. And that includes inspection, regular repairs, and all of that. I think for us, the, the important thing also is when you transition from the lawyer side where they work out the agreements, we have relationships with the, uh, with the public agency people on the ground to try and set in place an understanding because most of the times the guys sitting on the mowers don't understand what's written in an agreement, right? They're just saying, well, if it's growing, I'm going to mow it, right? But the, the challenge we run into is that, uh, you know, we've had some public agency contractors come in and mow our prairie areas that aren't supposed to be mown. Uh, and so it's a bit of education, but I, I think it's, it's a lot of continuing communication between the multiple agencies is really the only way you're going to get through it. That's great. Thank you. Nicole, do you have any thoughts on this? 
Sure. Yeah. Again, I'm with a local municipality and we're, we're a pretty small community. Um, but I think typically we, we approach it really based on sort of ownership boundaries really is what it comes down to. Um, so the city, at least in my, so I work for public works, public works will maintain all of our streets and sidewalks. Um, when we get to the boundary of a park, for example, though, then it switches over to the parks department. Um, our equipment is also separate. Um, you know, there are times where we will basically offer our equipment um, pretty much though, like when we're done with it, if they still need work done, they can come in to borrow it and use it. So I think that has been one of the reasons that, um, as an example, our parks department has their own fleet of equipment because it's difficult to leave their facilities unmaintained until we're done with the streets and sidewalks. Um, for bridges, I know there was a question about that. Um, we typically kind of share it with the adjacent communities. And so it's kind of like, you know, our plows will cross the bridge, do a loop, turn around and come back. And it might be the same on the other community. So I think in some ways the bridges probably get maintained at least wintertime a little bit more regularly um, for things like concrete maintenance and surface maintenance. That is definitely uh, more of a conversation point. And I think similar to trend, like having good working relationships with our um, adjacent communities and our state agencies uh, really helps to make sure that we're all on the same page and coordinating those maintenance activities. Great. Just curious, um, do any of you have those maintenance responsibilities assigned and kind of tied to any of your asset management databases so it's really clearly kind of identified in there? We do use GIS to map all of our assets and all of those maps then are shared with the other public agencies so they can clearly see where we're doing our maintenance as it overlaps with where they're doing their maintenance. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And we are really just building a comprehensive asset management tool. So um, we are in the process of getting everything mapped and into this system. But um, again, similar to Trend, this I think will be a really useful tool so that we can share it with all of our uh, partners and other stakeholders and make things a little bit more streamlined. Great. Um, John, just uh, you know, to add on to that from the state perspective, have you um, in your role uh, or within your office, have you all helped to negotiate some of those agreements between the state and local agencies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, maintenance is always a big question um, and ownership is always a big question when you're dealing with a uh, state department and an adjacent uh, locality. Um, I know we talked about bridges, but bridges can be a big thing. Like who maintains the bridge if you have a state road going underneath and a local road going over top? Um, like a, a lot of stuff can come up with that. Um, to kind of talk to um, what Trent talked about too, like the Virginia Department of Transportation also came up with a GIS um, layer kind of outlining ownership of all of VDOT's roadways and all of the localities' roadways so that um, anyone um, in the public can go in there and see exactly who maintains each street um, and for how long and where those boundaries are as well. That's great. Um, well, along those lines, and this might be a better question for John and Nicole um, and Michael, but regarding specifically sidewalk maintenance, um, what are the types of policies that your agency has in place regarding sidewalk maintenance? So uh, for localities, um, we essentially um, have it written in that within their maintenance budget, they are allowed to use those funds um, within the sidewalks for how much of those funds they want to use on the sidewalks and sidewalk maintenance. It's really going to be up to them and each locality is going to be different. Um, they all have different priorities and, and different goals that they want to accomplish. They have different paving schedules, different sidewalk maintenance schedules. Um, okay. It is going to vary a lot. And yeah. I think Nicole can probably speak to the specifics a lot more. Yeah, that's great to hear. So it sounds like the VDOT funding for maintenance can go to sidewalks, um, which is good to hear. Um, uh, Nicole, do you know what, what's uh, Burlington do regarding sidewalk maintenance funding? So we use our capital funding for sidewalk maintenance and um, 
recently we've, we've tried to set a goal of basically tripling our maintenance activities and we have a, um, a, a planning tool that is kind of two tiered to help us prioritize our maintenance. One is based on deficiencies so that we make sure they're accessible. But the second tier is um, like a, a mapping layer that basically prioritizes sidewalks that are in the areas that we anticipate the most demand. So either by large housing um, neighborhoods or near parks, downtown schools, that sort of thing. So we try to prioritize the sidewalks that are in the worst condition in the most heavily traveled areas. Um, the city does maintain all the sidewalks. We do um, rely on grants to build new sidewalks. So if we have any gaps in our network, that's where we really rely on state and federal funding to kind of help us fill those gaps. But then we do try to use our own capital funding for the regular maintenance. Great. Um, Michael, I was wondering if you might be able to speak to maybe the broader conversation um, that's been going on around sidewalk maintenance funding um, more specifically and why in particular sidewalk maintenance is, you know, kind of its own a topic unto itself uh, in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. I was just reading uh, one of the questions from John. Um, who he talks about how uh, you know jurisdictions that require adjacent property owners to pay for maintenance uh, have uh, that approach has always always bothered him because it seems like it's it's part of the public right of way. Why shouldn't it be maintained uh, by the municipality? And I recall that <clears throat> that was a very huge, uh, very large topic of of discussion when we were writing the guide um, eight or nine years ago, and we did a lot of interviews with. With localities, and it it seemed that um, you know very few jurisdictions were taking that hardline approach that um, you know property owners are 100% responsible. Um, and what what the key that came out of those discussions is that having a really clear policy in place and having funds in place to for the the public agency to to do those activities when when it's necessary and to help out certain homeowners that have a hard time. Uh, you know, it's a real financial burden um, for, for certain homeowners. Um, so that was a um, big topic of discussion in the, in the guide uh, about the, that sort of balance between public funding and, and private property funding. Um, I do agree, and there's been a lot of other comments uh, just around like, you know, what is the appropriate amount of um, funding to set aside for maintenance activities? And I feel like this is a definitely a topic that could be touched on in, in greater depth in the update. Well, I think that actually ties in really well to the next question, which Trent, um, this one is specifically for you, um, but then maybe we'll broaden it to the to the larger group is that um, the question was, how did the Houston Park Board raise 120 million, which I think all of us are in awe of that amount. <laughs> yes, uh, so in Houston, we are blessed with some very large foundations, uh, people that uh, truly believe that parks and green space are critical to quality of life. Uh, we got our, our one major donor uh, to commit to a $50 million donation. So that took off, you know, a huge chunk of, of the 120 we needed to raise. Uh, but it was critical to get that donation first because then it set in place a, a mindset that this was really going to happen, right? And so then you would pick up a million here, two million there. Sometimes it was spread out over multiple years. Uh, but, but we ended up raising, of the 120 million, we raised um, about 103, 104, I think, privately. And then we got some federal grants as well to help cover. Uh, there were a few state grants mixed in. Um, but it, it's, um, it's a blessing to have that kind of resource available to the community here. Well, that's great. Uh, and it definitely is. And I feel like with the amount of storm uh, activity that you've had that's been really helpful to continue to maintain those facilities. Um, Nicole uh, and John, if I could talk to you both about, and maybe you two could elaborate on um, how you are planning appropriately sort of to have that funding set aside for maintenance. Um, and, you know, if there's been any issues with, you know, maybe it's things like um, the cost of materials or, 
Um, just, you know, Nicole thinking about the quick build projects and the amount of maintenance that they've required, um, you know, has that caused you to reevaluate that formula that you've been using? Yeah, I think um, our quick build program in particular, I would say it hasn't, we definitely aren't reevaluating the program itself in terms of its usefulness and its future. We have reevaluated um, how we'll maintain it. You know, we initially planned to do it all in house, and um, it, it's a lot for our team to keep up with. Um, so we contracted for some of the work um, with an external contractor and have kind of come back sort of full circle now um, with our in house teams kind of showing their interest again and in trying to take this on, but understanding that uh, trying to do it with the resources that they had just wasn't um, going to be viable. So we are taking a more uh, strategic and comprehensive approach to trying to map this out and really understand what their needs are. Um, we're also partnering with others like our parks department. Um, you know, we have contracted out our planter maintenance um, ever since we started the program, but they've always been interested in taking that on themselves since they maintain so many other uh, plantings in the city parks. And so that is something that we're actively talking about of uh, being able to partner with them as well. Um, in terms of the, the rest of our kind of ongoing maintenance, um, we do have, we have a sort of structured amount that is always available for kind of our baseline maintenance. Uh, we have relied on things like um, voter approved bonds to do more. And so we, we're still grappling with like, what is a sustainable level of funding for maintenance? Because we, we know that, you know, for many, many years, we just deferred a lot of the maintenance. And so we're trying to catch up now and um, we still aren't quite at the sustainable level. So um, yeah, I have not found the perfect solution yet, but are still actively working on it. Like I'm sure many others here. And yeah. I, know, I know speaking from the state level, each locality is going to be so different um, with how they utilize their maintenance funding. Um, and I know the past couple of years with COVID hitting, and um, I've had a lot of localities reach out to me and just say, I think we're going to have a huge carryover um, and we're going to have to move that forward to the next year because we weren't able to um, get all the paving done we wanted to get done. A lot of our projects were put on hold. Um, so, I mean, it's going to differ so much um, year to year what kind of work you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then of course, at the state level, the funding is gonna be determined by the code and the growth rate is gonna be um, the same for municipalities as it is for uh, VDOT's roadways as well. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's really helpful to kind of hear the variety of perspectives on that front. Um, John, I'd like to follow back up with you um, with another question that we received. Um, and uh, it was from another representative of a state DOT um, who struggles with awarding projects to local agencies um, because, you know, maybe issues with them not maintaining their current system. And so kind of expanding additional funds to them, um, you know, when they know that they're kind of challenged with maintaining what they have to begin with. Um, do you have any thoughts on kind of the, uh, you know, maybe any uh, suggestions or how that has worked for you in Virginia? Absolutely. Yeah, we have a lot of checks in place um, to not really ensure our localities are maintaining their roadways effectively, but to kind of like help them along and then help them recognize where they're struggling. Um, one of these areas is we do a um, VDOT or state run arterial inspection for all of our um, localities. That's basically every year we have a VDOT representative go out, drive all of the arterial roads, mark any deficiencies, and then provide that to our localities. Say, here's what I saw, here's what needs to be corrected. Um, and then those localities will then go in and uh, make those corrections. They can adjust their paving schedules um, according to those comments. Um, I know one other area that we try to encourage um, proper maintenance is that we have a supplementary funding program and you will actually score better if your application is from a locality who has spent 25% of their maintenance budget on their pavement. So if they've spent 25% of their maintenance budget on pavement, they get extra points and are more likely to be awarded that supplementary 
uh, maintenance funding. So that's another way we try to help encourage localities to allocate their funds correctly because we don't tell them you have to spend this much in this category, you have to spend this much in this category. You know, we're really there to provide guidance, not, you know, rules. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's great to hear. Um, and I think that's a really interesting example of incentivizing um, local agencies to do it. And then maybe one just follow up question, Don, on that topic is that, you know, for agencies who are still con continuing to struggle with it, because maybe they don't have the bandwidth to take on, um, you know, leading contracts and whatnot, you know, is that something that VDOT also helps agencies with, you know, either with providing sort of like, you know, um, services from VDOT staff or help with contractual um, items? Uh, is that a way for you to help local agencies that are struggling themselves? Absolutely, yeah. So um, I work for local assistance division. I think this is one of the great things about VDOT is that um, we started this division that is basically out to help our municipalities um, with various funding programs, provide them with the guidance that they need, have somebody that they know that they can call if they have any questions um, for the various programs. Um, and so like a lot of like, I would say probably half of my day is talking with municipalities and residency staff, um, trying to help them with their maintenance allocations, how they can get things done, how projects can get done, um, stuff like that. Great. All right. Um, well, I have to say, everyone, um, this has been incredibly informative. Thank you so much to all of our presenters today. Ellen, maybe if we could bring up the last couple of slides there. We want to touch on a couple of things because we know that we're at time here. Um, the first, while we are pulling that up, is just to note that um, that after this, I, the um, Federal Highway will be advancing the new um, the update to the maintenance guide. If you are interested in serving on the stakeholder group for it, please put your information into the Q&A along with the agency that you're with and some form of contact information, especially email. Um, uh, but, you know, after this, you'll receive an email um, that will contain a survey, and within that survey, um, you can note your request for continu continuing education units. Um, if you need it urgently, you can note that in the survey as well, and we'll get you those CEUs right away. Um, we're also going to be sharing out the meeting materials with everyone um, on this uh, webinar today, everyone who's registered, and the recording will be posted to uh, the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, that's PBIC, um, to their web page. Um, so you'll be able to find a recording there. Um, so with that, um, thank you all so much for your time. Um, and you'll find our contact information within the slides that are shared out if you'd like to reach out to any of us. All right. Well, thank you and everyone have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.